Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> I was going to be late on this post game podcast, the uh, the hot takes podcast after the Florida State win over Virginia Tech, which was comfortable but not as comfortable as it should have been <laughs> because of taking my girls to a uh, to a soccer game tonight took the opportunity i figured this would be a good weekend to do it and then you know as the night went on noticed that there might be a reason to to delay recording a little bit further and sure enough my goodness this evening delivered <sighs> miami Oh my goodness, what are you doing? You talk about unbelievable coaching malpractice from Mario Cristobal and that staff. And the funny, the, the, the wild thing is that this is not the first time he's done this. I mean, for those of you who are listening to this before you check the scores on Sunday morning, Miami, all they had to do is kneel. And they win the football game. And instead, they run the football up the middle with the running back. And actually, I think Cheney was down. And I, I think that call should have been overturned. I think his, his left, left arm was clearly down before the, before the strip, before the ball came out. And, and so I think it's actually the wrong call. But they gave them the opportunity to make that call because they didn't just decide to kneel and go in. I mean, in fairness, I, I do understand it is Miami. They don't have a lot of experience with the victory formation. So, you know, maybe they're not comfortable in it, but <laughs> all you had to do is kneel down and you walk away with a win. They had a win probability of 99.9% with a minute 22 left in that game and lost. <laughs> that, and, and simply because you just chose not to kneel. And like I said, this is not the first time for Mario Cristobal on this. Back when he was at Oregon, they were playing uh, at Stanford or actually, I think, no, it was a home game. They were playing Stanford, and they were up three. All they needed to do was kneel down two more times, and it would get the, the clock down to like 16 seconds, get a punt off, and you win the game. And they ran the football and fumbled. Stanford drove down and uh, put the kicked a field goal to put the game in overtime and won in overtime. So it's the second time that he's done something like this, but this one was far worse because they're not even leaving 16 seconds on the clock. You just kneel and you're down. This guy, Cristobal, Cristobal was standing at the blackjack table and hit on 21. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, again, I mean, that game never should have been that close. And, you know, you, they gave themselves uh, lots of opportunities to to lose that game earlier as well. I mean, they just didn't play a very good football football game against against a Georgia Tech team that came in better prepared. But my goodness, wow! <laughs> I mean, that was that was far worse in terms of a coaching malpractice side of things than say the couple defensive calls at the end of the Jacksonville state game a couple years ago, which I at Florida state, which I, you know, I criticized at the time as just boneheaded and they were, but this, I mean, this is just next level, man. <laughs> oh, you know, Miami started four and oh, and now may well finish the season. I mean, it's possible Miami could finish the season three and five with the remaining schedule. They, they could easily finish seven and five after starting four and oh. Just finding ways. I mean, because that they're they're playing North Carolina next. North Carolina can beat that Miami team. I mean, you got Drake May at quarterback, you got a puncher's chance against just about anybody. 
But, I mean, they just dominated a Syracuse team that hung with Clemson better than they hung with North Carolina. <laughs> so that's going to be a game coming off of this that Miami's going to have to get up for. And then, of course, they're going to have to play at Clemson and play at Florida State. And this is this is a team that's going to have pretty rough go down the stretch, and they're going to have to get off the mat <laughs> after this one. And here's the thing. If you're a player, I mean, they, they, you saw if you see the replay of this, there, there's a player, looks to be an offensive lineman, I don't know who it is, who's crying on the sideline, understandably, and you can read his lips. You know, what the expletive are we doing? What the expletive were we doing running running the ball? Yeah, son, everybody, everybody who was watching it was wondering exactly the same thing. And here's the thing. This is the sort of thing that causes you to question your coaches. I mean, you can lose a locker room with this stuff. So, especially if you're a bit of a hard donkey as it is. And, you know, that, that this is going to be interesting to see how that how that works out down there. But, um, yeah. All right, let's get to the Florida State side of things. Um, first first quarter looked real good. You know, that that uh, that's what things should look like. I mean, we talked about this in terms of the um, in terms of the, the, the preview that Florida State should be able to come out and dominate early and put this game away. And they were in position to. First quarter numbers, Florida State was up 22 to nothing, 198 total yards, 6.3 yards per carry on the ground, gave up 2.3, 2.5 yards per carry on the ground, gave up total of nine yards in the first half, 198 to nine yards in the first, in the first quarter. And then 22 to nothing score. And just utter and complete dominance. 7.1 yards per play on offense, gave up one yard per play on defense. Exactly what you needed in that first quarter. And in the second quarter, it flipped. Virginia Tech won the second quarter 10 to nothing, and the total yard disparity was 126 to 1. Florida State had one yard in the second quarter. And Virginia Tech averaged 5.5 yards per play in the second quarter and gave up 0.1 yards per play in the second quarter because Florida State had one total yard on seven plays. And this has basically been the the MO for this Florida State team so far this season. They've been a team that just looks as good as anybody in the country for small stretches of time, for you know, a quarter, quarter and a half at a time. Florida State looks like a buzzsaw that can that that might be the best team in the country. And then they just get lost. And you look at this this Virginia Tech game, and that's that's what happened. They just, little things, just small little inconsistencies and little bits of lack of attention to detail catch up with them. And then they wind up in dogfights or in deeper in games than they should be against teams that, you know, against a Virginia Tech or against a Boston College that has no business hanging with you. And this, in some ways, looked a little bit like that Boston College game after Florida State got up by, what, 21 points in that one and then sort of let Boston College claw back into it. And this one, that's exactly what happened. I mean, Florida State's up 22 to nothing. And then you blink and it's 28 to 17 after that kickoff return for for a touchdown. And that's something you definitely got to clean up. This is just a team that has not yet fully gelled and you know the hope was that they would that they would come out of the of the bye week locked and loaded and ready to go and in some ways they did again the opening quarter suggested that okay they've found themselves they they know who they are now they're going to put pressure on you on the on the offense or on the defensive side they're going to suffocate you on that side tight coverage bring some bring some extra pr- uh, extra pressure shut down the run Offense, run the football with some success, throw it with some success on play action, and just, you know, they looked looked every bit the juggernaut that they should have been coming out of the bye. And then, like I said, they you know just found a way to lose focus just a little bit. And honestly, it's not so much the defense on this one that I would, I would blame on that side. 
One total yard in the second quarter on seven plays is not going to get it done. You know, that's... They were two of three for three passing yards in the in the uh, in the second quarter. Ran it four times for minus five. There's your problem. Two punts. You know, had had two drives in the in the second quarter, and that's it. Partly, this is where you can give the defense a little bit of a little bit of uh, of, of credit for this. Virginia Tech had the ball for twenty three total plays in the second ha- in the second quarter, partly because the defense didn't get off the field. So that combination of the defense not getting off the field and then the offense stalling out just a little bit, that we've seen that a little bit too much so far this year. And they're going to have to figure a little bit of that out. Now, I do think you look at the second half and they started to figure some of that out, at least on the offensive side. Second half, Florida State averaged 9.7 yards per play, had 184 rushing yards and averaged 11.5 yards per carry, thanks to a couple of long, long runs. But... They still, on defense in the second half, still gave up 107 rushing yards, 5.9 yards per carry, and that's just not good enough. You've got to choke those teams out. Now, the flip side of this is Florida State's not been given points up in the second, second half. So if you want to look at the, at, the last, at, the, at the success of Florida State defensively in the second half, it's been pretty good on the season. I mean, you think about this. Against LSU, Florida State gave up zero in the second half. Now, nobody stopped that LSU offense so far this year. Nobody. Except for Florida State in the second half of that game. That LSU offense, by the way, might be, along with Ohio State maybe, the other team in the country with wide receivers like what Florida State can put out there. Or at least could. I mean, we'll see what what the situation with Johnny Wilson is. The most concerning thing about this game coming out of it the Virginia Tech game is Johnny Wilson kind of getting twisted up there. Looked like maybe a hip or something. Maybe could have been a couple of different things on that left side. And he just didn't look comfortable coming off the field. And, you know, you needed to get out of that game without injury. Now you've still got some weeks. If he needs to take some time to get fully healthy, great. But, you know, big body like his and twisting it up like that, you just, you don't know what it might be. And so there, I've got some concern there. We'll see. Uh, I, I haven't, looked into it yet we'll we'll find out what uh what, what's going on there could be just you know got jammed up and he's going to be fine I, I don't know but in any case LSU might have the the best set of wide receivers aside from Florida State and Ohio State in the country and second half five drives zero points gave up no points against Southern Miss that's not a big deal there scored also scored scored a defensive touchdown in that game second half against Boston College was the one one half where you've given up any any points. 14 points against Boston College. Clemson it was even cuz they gave up 7 and they scored a scored a defensive touchdown in the second half. And then Virginia Tech ran the football in the second half, had some had some success in terms of 107 rushing yards, 5.9 yards per carry. But you know how many points the defense gave up in the second half? Once again, zero. So they are finding ways to to close the deal there. You just want to see them get off the field a little faster. You want to see them get that yards per play down just a little bit in terms of down-to-down dominance a little bit more consistently. And you want to see that stretch to the first half where I think they they need to be a little bit more consistent in terms of that. And I do think this is a trend where Fuller and, and, and the Florida State defense, since Fuller's been at Florida State, have basically not had the most success in the first half. They've had a lot, they've had a, a lot better success in second halves since Fuller has been at Florida State. And at some point, they're going to need to start taking a second half approach in the first half. But all that said, you look at the final, final tally here. And, you know, 39 to 17, it's about what kind of we expected. My pregame was what, 45 to 17. You know, same same ballpark. Those 17 came a little earlier than what you'd like. I thought maybe they'd get one score late, you know, probably 10, you know, while it mattered, something like that. And that was about there. Average yards per play, Florida State at 7.4. That's plenty comfortable. Uh, Virginia Tech at five. That's a full two yards higher than it should have been, honestly. 
because you look at that first half, 4.2 yards per play, you know, while it really mattered, that that should have been, like I said, that should have been with a, a number with a three. And, you know, that's where I was coming in, coming into this game. You shouldn't be giving up more than four yards a, a play to this Virginia Tech team. And, and they found some ways to kind of trip over themselves a couple times and, and give up a couple plays. But when it came time to end drives and to, uh, to dominate up front, Florida State was able to do that. Welcome back to the sack party. Jared Verse had a couple in this game. It's not like he hasn't been living in the backfield. It's just teams haven't really given him a whole lot of opportunity to get sacks. And in this game, Virginia Tech finally gave him a couple of those opportunities and he took them. The get off is just crazy. And, you know, otherwise you feel pretty good about what you saw. I, I did not watch this game. I have to admit, I did not watch this game as closely as I, I do most games on the first time through. Uh, I did not, you know, do a whole lot of rewinding and, and evaluating as I was going through. So I'm, I'm going to have more to, to say on the, um, on the second thoughts than I, than I do here in terms of specific things to pick up on. Do think that they did find their footing a little bit in the running game. Uh, backs hit their seams just a little bit better. And, and we talked about that in the, in, in the pregame, that this would be a game where they'd have some chances at some long runs just because of some, some of uh, Virginia Tech's history in terms of some misfits from the back end from their, their backers and safeties, and that, that proved true. Uh, and Benson took advantage of that. And it's good to see him get, get out and get some big plays going because he is really a rhythm back. The more they can get him in rhythm the next couple games, the better. Uh, you know, Keon Coleman was pretty quiet in this one. Didn't really need to force the ball to him all that much. Johnny Wilson you know, led the led the team with four catches for 54. It's really not not a game where they threw the ball a bunch. What 24 th- 24 passes? Not trying to push it down the field a bunch. Uh, mostly a game where they they tried to to run it and spread the ball a little bit to some some other guys. Great little uh, great catch by Destin Hill. Had a catch for 30 yards. Uh, flash some of his contested uh, catch ability. Guy that you can really be excited about. All in all, you know, a successful outing. I mean, could have been like what happened in Miami, and it wasn't. You know, you took care of business, move on to next week. I'll evaluate a little more closely. Might take a, a few extra, might take an extra day or two this week. I'm I'm making a research trip to Chicago uh, leaving tomorrow, uh, leaving, well, I guess most of you will be listening to this on Sunday. So leaving, uh, later on Sunday, and then I'll be back on, uh, Wednesday. So I'm planning on doing some of the recording up in, uh, up in Chicago while I'm there, but exactly when that stuff's going to release is going to be a little bit, uh, touch and go, but we'll, we'll figure it out until then. <laughs> let's enjoy the, uh, the schadenfreude while we have the opportunity this week. This is, uh, I mean, it makes sense. First game of October for for Miami, and you know that's sort of you turn the calendar from September to October, and the you know the preseason championship that Miami wins, or the off season championship that Miami wins every year, is sort of fading out by the time you get to October, and it's time for Miami to have their annual collapse. And uh, yeah, good for them. They're they're right on schedule. That'll do for us. Thanks for listening. If you've been enjoying this podcast, please leave a five-star rating over at Apple Podcasts and wherever else you listen to podcasts, post and repost episodes on social media, and tell a friend. And if you haven't left a review in a while, do it again. It really does help the visibility of the podcast. Before we go, I'd also like to thank my advertising partners once more. That's EPR Creations, Louis Marquez of Keller Williams Realty in Jacksonville, Florida, Shenandoah Real Estate in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, Garage Makeovers, the number one garage remodeling company in South Florida, and Justin Galloway of Benchmark Mortgage, serving Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky. You can also stop by the Unconquered shop at unconqueredpodcast.com where you can buy stickers, pins, magnets, t-shirts, and other swag. And thanks also to all those supporters over at Patreon where I post video analysis and field questions for the podcast. I am especially grateful to those above the dynasty level. That is Andrew Garrett, Brian Leininger, Neil Cook, Casey Kidd, Chris Chartrand, Dave Blair, Hector Cartagena, Jack Horton, Jimmy Van, Jonathan Kennedy, Keith Cheney, Lee Caswell, Tyler Kashishke, 
Vince Calandra, and Bert Bertoldi. You all are far more generous than I deserve. I'm really grateful. Thanks to you all. This has been Unconquered with Doc Staples. I'm your host, Jason Staples. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. I made this. <laughs>